Hello, and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly for October 7th, 2019. Um, this is our time of the week to get together and talk about what's going on in CircuitPython, both uh, in terms of the people who are in this meeting and also the community in general. Um, this meeting is held on typically held on Mondays, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, if it is held on a different day, we do let you know. Um, this meeting is held on Discord, uh, which if you uh, want to talk to us at any other time during the week, we are almost always available. Um, you can go to adafru.it slash discord and find us in the CircuitPython channel. Um, this meeting is recorded, so the uh, the Discord window and also the audio for the meeting is uh, recorded. If you are, um, if you if you do not have a microphone or you don't want your voice recorded, let us know that you are text only, and you can still give us updates uh, via text, and we will read them out as we get to them. Um, this meeting is uh, the recording will be put up on um, YouTube. And also, uh, we are on a number of podcasts. So if you find that we are not on your podcast service, please let us know so we can uh, remedy that. This meeting is held in five parts. Um, the first part is community news, where we talk about uh, what's going on with uh, Python on hardware in the community um, or what's going on with Python in general in the community. Uh, the next section is the state of circuit python and the libraries which is a statistical overview of the entire project um, we talk about it overall and then we get into a little bit of detail on the core and then the libraries the next part is hug reports which is an opportunity to call people out for doing something good that section is held as a round robin where i will start as an example and then we will move through the list alphabetically in the event that there are people who have notes are, and are not in the meeting or um, are uh, um, text only, um, I will read them off in alphabetical order. Um, the next section is status updates, which is an opportunity um, to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you're going to do through the next meeting. So take a couple of minutes, talk about your projects. Um, we've heard about everything from CircuitPython stuff to bathroom remodeling. So we, uh, we love to hear about what's going on with you regardless of what, um, what it's about. And the final section we lovingly call In the Weeds, which is a opportunity for more long form discussions. Um, if uh, something comes up during status updates that seems like it's going to turn into a longer form discussion, we can move it to In the Weeds. Or if you already have a topic, feel free to add it to the notes document that was linked earlier um, or post it into the CircuitPython chat and we can add it to the notes. Um, there are already two In the Weeds topics, uh, which is excellent and that's how we like to do it. Um, so if you think of anything for In the Weeds, uh, feel free to add it early so that we are not waiting. Um, CircuitPython is a version of Python that is designed to run on microcontrollers, which are tiny computers. Um, CircuitPython development is sponsored by Adafruit, so please support them by purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. And with that, uh, we will move on to community news, and I will turn it over to Phil. All right. Thank you, Katni. And thank you, everyone, who is patient, because I have the last minute meeting stuff, all good stuff, though. OK, first up. Happy Ada Lovelace Day tomorrow, everyone. You can check out our site where we do something every single year if you want to celebrate the achievements of women in science, technology, and engineering, and math, STEMs, also the arts. Some people like to call it STEAM. Uh, check it out and also check out findingada.com, which didn't link because uh, I didn't put the things in front of it, but I will now. Boop. So you'll see that tomorrow. Every uh, year we celebrate, showcase, and have a ton of great posts, usually tw at least 24 posts in the day. So check that out. Also, some big thanks here. Um, the Circuit Python and Moo book is shipping in Japan. Um, 
the author sent us this lovely gift of two shirts, two of these things that you can put um, paperwork in and more, and there's a pinout, and then uh, two of the books. So I'm going to get some photos taken soon so you can see them, and we're going to try to get some in our store. We can also try to uh, get it translated, and we're also going to help the educators in the Japanese market get Circuit Python out there. The author said tons of Adafruit stuff out there, but Python and, and Circuit Python is still kind of new. So if anyone has any ideas or contacts over there as well, yes, we will try to carry the, the shirt as well if we can. I would very much like that. Um, next up, and I think we have the author of this in the Discord chat. Lessons learned from building a custom circuit Python board by Thea Flowers. I saw this on the Twitters for this uh, cool MIDI uh, controlled board, and then there was a guide. So I added this to the newsletter. Check it out. And th this is a good one if you're thinking about adding circuit Python to your board. Um, here's a neat step by step thing. I think uh, Grover, uh, CG Grover had chimed into and said, "Yeah, this is this is pretty good." It's minds of uh, reminded the person of that experience as well. Uh, next up. CircuitPython Slizzers onto a new board. Um, Les, who usually does a really good Microcontroller Monday article, chose the Serpente, and this is from Arturo. So this is a really neat little board. If you like to DigiSpark, but you like yourself some Python, that's the way to do it. Next up, EuroPython videos are posted. Um, there's a lot of them, including some of the folks from our community. So there's Antol, there's Radimir, there's, uh, let's see, Ben, and then there's also, uh, I think there's a couple others. Um, there's some good some machine learning ones too. So we put these on our site. We also put in a newsletter and they're linked up here. It is open source hardware month. And that means we're doing a, sing a post every single day. Uh, a little reminder, CircuitPython is open source and so is all of our hardware. So I've been doing a post a day. Uh, if you have stories, open source stories, send them in. Um, so far, it's just been helping to get the word out about what open source hardware is. Some of the things that you can do, uh, you can get it certified with Oshawa. They have a certification program. Um, celebrating some of the folks who did that, there's uh, the first bit of open source hardware that came from China. That was Naomi. She helped get that going, and it was for the Sino bit, which is kind of like a micro bit. And then I have stuff all the way down to like the history of the domain openhardware.org, and it used to be owned by like a hip hop site, which is cool. So you can see the twist and turns of all the things that go into this open source thing. But it's working out because we've been doing this for like a decade and more. And then last up, um, all this stuff and more is in the newsletter. It's still in draft. Every single week, you can do issues or pull requests, add stuff to it. Or you can email us, or you can put it in the chat, or you can tweet, whatever it is, and we'll add it to the newsletter. About 6,000 people right now. Um, it's on adafruitdaily.com. We don't spam or do anything like that. And everyone can see the newsletter get created every single week. And that is the community news. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. All right. Next up is the state of CircuitPython and the libraries. This is a statistical overview of the project. It gives us a chance to talk about it in terms of numbers and just get an idea of the health of the project um, entirely in terms of um, what uh, what's going on with it uh, numbers wise. So uh, first we will talk about the project overall. So overall we had 24 pull requests merged by 21 authors and this is super exciting. Um, this month is Hacktoberfest as well. And uh, during Hacktoberfest, uh, if you do four pull requests onto any um, open source uh, project on GitHub, uh, you get a free shirt. And so we wanted to participate. So we put a lot of effort into um, getting some Hacktoberfest labeled issues out there. And we had a, a lot of responses. So I want to call out the people that I have not seen before. Um, A.B. Kosar, uh, Sequira AC, Huayle1097, Shalmo, Screen16, D. Sudoth, William3031, Romana Kozak, OM8007, Il Monso. Um, thank you so much. Welcome to our community. And uh, we really appreciate you picking up um, those 
those issues and uh, joining us in uh, what we do. And we had nine reviewers, which is also excellent. Thank you to everyone who's reviewing. Um, we can't uh, do what we do without having uh, reviewers and obviously with so many new people coming in, it's been really handy to have um, extra reviewers because we're, we, we want to make sure that we give the people who are joining us a, a good experience so they know what it's really like to be a part of this community and part of that good experience is to make sure that we are not letting any new PRs um, sit for too long. So thank you very much to everybody who's been jumping in and helping with that. Um, and we had, uh, in terms of issues, 26 issues closed by 11 people and 22 opened by seven people. And that is entirely related as well to Hacktoberfest. I opened over 20 issues um, to have good first issues for Hacktoberfest. And uh, those have also, many of those have been closed. Um, by the PR fixes that people have put in. So overall, we are still working towards um, towards 5.0. Uh, we are making a lot of changes to the BLE API and uh, working towards having a uh, Bluetooth workflow. Um, so that's sort of the important thing that we're doing at the moment. Um, in terms of the libraries, uh, there is obviously every time we're coming up with a new board, we're getting new libraries. Um, so there's been a lot of work on that and also um, working with all the fixes that people are putting in and making sure that we're keeping up with uh, releases so that all those fixes are actually um, added to the libraries that people are using. So overall, I think we're doing great. Um, I know that the BLE stuff, um, we're working towards trying to get that to a point where it's more stable, um, but right now it is definitely in flux. And with that, I will turn it over to Scott to talk about the core. All right, thank you, Katni. Uh, for the core, we had four pull requests merged from three different authors, all folks who have contributed before. And we had three reviewers as well, so thank you to everyone who did that. Um, we have 11 open pull requests. Uh, I won't list them off here, but you can check the notes for that. Uh, we'll probably get that down number down a couple uh, because I will. I haven't gone through pull requests today. And in fact, I think Dan already merged one of them. Um, so that number is a little out of date. Uh, issue wise, we had four closed issues by four people and nine opened by four people. 192 total open issues. Uh, you can go to the URL github.com slash adafruit slash circuit python slash issues to see all of those. And uh, we have seven active milestones. The major one that I like to look at is the, the number of issues without a milestone, and that's 14. So uh, if anybody wants to go classify issues that would be, or assign milestones, that would be cool too. Uh, I'll probably get to it when I'm kind of through these BLE weeds that I'm currently in. Um, but otherwise, it's all good. Um, nothing super urgent. 4.0 has been going well, so we don't need to get anything out the door immediately. Uh, download stats, we have 4.1.0 is our stable release, and 5.0 alpha 4 is our unstable release. Uh, Download-wise, uh, 4.1.0 has 11,560 downloads, and on the alpha, we have 2,201. So uh, if you haven't tried the 5.0, I recommend it. Uh, there's lots of good stuff in there. Um, and yeah, give it a shot. Uh, download stats by language are also in the notes, but I will not cover that breakdown. But if you're curious, take a look in the notes. And I'll hand it back to Katni for libraries. Thank you. Um, and a quick note about the alpha. Um, please use it. Uh, try it with your projects. And if you run into issues, uh, file an issue for us um, so yep. we know what's going on with that. But I know that it's been working pretty solidly with most things. So um, we haven't run into that too much. Yeah, I kind of think once the BLE stuff settle, settles out, we'll get through beta pretty quickly to the release candidate. I agree. All right, so next up is the libraries. So on the libraries, we had 20 pull requests merged by 18 authors, including all of the people I listed off earlier, and eight reviewers. So thank you very much to everyone who's been helping out with that and to everyone who has joined us. We currently have 39 open pull requests um, those are all listed in the notes, so if you're interested, um, take a look. And uh, one of the things 
that we are currently working on is getting um, circuitpython.org slash libraries slash contributing updating daily and the final step of that should be happening today and at that point it will be um, available to track everything going on with the libraries across all the repos and so it'll be much easier for other people to get involved um, with actually keeping track of all this because at the moment it involves actually going through each individual repo and finding PRs and that sort of thing so it's not all in one place. Um, so hopefully we get that finalized and then we will have a much better way to get more people involved having a central place to actually send them. We had 22 issues closed by eight people and 13 open by three people for 146 open issues. Um, again, there's a link to circuitpython.org slash library slash contributing in the notes, uh, which is currently only updated weekly, but that should be changing very quickly. And in the last uh, seven days, we've had three updated libraries, um, which are also linked in the notes. And that is the state of CircuitPython and the libraries. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug reports is a chance to call people out for doing something good. Um, it's uh, just anything that um, anybody's done or something you'd like to call people out for, or even uh, we often just do um, a group hug to the community. Um, and those are obviously always welcome also. So I will start as an example and we'll go through the list. Um, I will read off people who have notes um, in the document or who are text only um, as we go and I will uh, do that alphabetically. Um, so yeah, all right, I will get started. Um, my first talk report is for Summersoft for getting circuitpython.org slash library slash contributing data up to AWS so we can move forward with getting that updated regularly and for all of the Adabot work. Um, to Justin for the work in progress PR that will finish getting the slash library slash contributing updated regularly. To all the folks who have joined us on GitHub through Hacktoberfest, welcome to our community. And to Crayola for walking me for, through my first 3D print, which actually worked. Um, so next up, uh, I have someone in the notes. Uh, So uh, Crayola says, uh, hug report to Dan H for some ideas on how to get uh, pixel buff completed to uh, Scott and Summersoft uh, for pointers regarding making native subclasses work and to Katni for putting up with me spending too much time of the weekend in the debugger and collecting more and more boards for my desk. And next up is maker Melissa. Hello. Okay, so uh, first, a uh, hug report to you, Katni, for your help with the downloads page uh, for the TFT DSL guide. Uh, hug to uh, Nicholas um, for being able to quickly implement any suggestions I had for Circa, and for Katni for the Salie again, because he was really handy this last week. That's it. All right. Thank you. We have a couple of lurkers, and then I have someone in the notes. Uh, Entol says, hug reports to Maker Melissa and Summersoft for work, suggestions, and reviews on Circup. Next, I have Sedacious in the notes, who says to Maker Melissa and Summersoft for fixing my Circup high PI PR. Then next up is Summersoft, who is text only, so I will read that off. To Katni, Tan Newt, and Maker Melissa for the PR reviews. To Dave Brichetti for the audio testing they're doing. And to all the Hacktoberfestians for their contributions. And non-Hacktoberfestians too, so everyone. And next up is Scott. Hi, hi. Uh, first off, a thank you to Wallarube. Uh, for adding a setting for higher current measurements to the INA 219 driver. Uh, thank you to Katni and Summersoft for kind of leading the Hacktoberfest crowds and keeping that rolling. Uh, it's been really successful so far, so thank you to those folks. Uh, thank you to John G for living on the edge with the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. I believe he bought a bunch and has been like really uh, pushing the limits and, and testing it out for us. I really appreciate that. Uh, shout out to Camille from Sony, who is prepping a bunch of, like, you'll see a little 
bunch of little PRs for the adding support for the Sony Sprints, Recents. I don't know what it's called. Uh, but we'll get CircuitPython support for that eventually. Uh, thanks to Thomas uh, Koneman for the German translation updates and Dan for doing the review on that. And then finally, uh, thank you to Thea for the awesome write-up about uh, all the gotchas around uh, making a custom CircuitPython board so that other folks don't make the same errors. All right. Excellent. Next up is, I have someone in the notes. Uh, Thea is lurking. However, um, a hug report to Tan Newt for helping me debug my board. It works now. Excellent. And that means next up is Brent. Um, hug report to Katni for labeling Hacktoberfest issues. Sedacious for pointing me in the right direction of some C++ code I was working on. And anecdote and doc model for continued work digging into the new firmware and persuading to me to dig further. Excellent. Sounds good. Um, I don't recall whether C Grover is lurking or not. Not lurking. Ah, all right. Excellent. Um, I want to give a group hug to the, to the team and the community today because I'm really appreciative of the level of effort put into the documentation, the examples, and tutorials as I scratch the surface in defining custom boards. But there are too many people just to list here. Um, so I'm impressed with the quality of the documentation, but uh, also the completeness of it. And um, again, thanks to Sedacious for life preservers he threw me this last week. Excellent. All right, next up is Dan. Um, I'd like to thank Scott for continuing to work on um, BL, the rework of the BLE API. He's got a lot of interesting ideas and he's done a really good job generalizing it and making it ultimately simpler in the long run. And then also I'd like to help two folks um, whose um, GitHub names are here, but um, you can also look them up on GitHub. They've been doing a lot of work in TinyUSB uh, for TAC, and TAC has also been working on it. A lot of things are going on in TinyUSB that I think I think it's good that more and more people are getting expertise in it and trying it on various things. That's really good. But we have some people who are really understand the depths of USB very well. So I'm really happy about that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is Dave Bracetti. Hi, all. C. Grover and Dan H. and others for helping me learn about on the CPX speaker. First, for being the first person in a while to add their info to our community directory. There's the link, everybody else. All right. Thank you. Next up is Deshipu, who is text only and has a group hug. Uh, and then next up is Hierofact. Just a group hug here. Um, yeah, big thanks to everybody, especially those working in the community for all the uh, stuff going on this month. Sounds like a lot to do and uh, a really good job doing it. Excellent. Thank you. Next up is Jason P. All right. Well, group hug to everyone. I, I don't have a lot of time this last couple of weeks or have not had a lot of time to do much, but I'll confess that I do like to open up Discord and just watch the chatter. And so it's interesting to see all the little things being worked on. And thanks to Maker Melissa for the quick response last uh, related to the software spy versus hardware spy thing. And then to uh, Scott, again, for continued patience as I'm trying to sort out this display I/O stuff. Like I said, I, I don't have a lot of time to be tinkering with it. So I tend to ask pretty simple questions, but I'm stepping my way through that. So thanks for that. All right. Excellent. Uh, next up, I have someone in the notes. Uh, that's Jeff Epler, who is missing the meeting, still on vacation, and uh, has a group hug for everyone. And then uh, I have uh, one last person in the notes as well. Um, Jerry, probably missing meeting, uh, also has a group hug. And that is hug reports. So next up is status updates. Status updates is uh, an opportunity to sync up on what you've been up to over the past week. 
and what you're going to be up to over the next week. It is uh, an opportunity to discuss it, but also an opportunity to receive tips and tricks on what it is you're doing. If you're blocked on something, uh, someone might have an idea or suggestion um, to provide and uh, can um, help out there. So take a couple minutes, tell us what you've been up to, tell us what you're going to be up to, and um, then uh, we will get through everyone um, who would like an opportunity to speak and or is in the notes, which I have quite a few people um, in the notes who are missing the meeting. So I will start as an example and then we'll go through the list alphabetically exactly the same as hug reports. So first up last week, went through all the issues on the libraries to identify good first issues and created over 20 new issues for Hacktoberfest. I've uh, been reviewing and merging various PRs um, stemming from that. Successfully tested the FT232H in VMware Fusion on Mac OS. Um, not a lot of reason why you would do that because it does work on Mac OS natively. Um, however, uh, it, it, we wanted to see whether it would work, and it did, just because sometimes VMware doesn't do um, hardware support uh, as you might expect it to, but it worked. Um, I finished the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit Bluetooth Examples, Playground Color Picker, and Playground Bluetooth Plotter, which I just noticed, I believe both of those have been published as of a couple minutes ago. Um, completed the Stemma Speaker Guide and the Fritzing Object to go with that. Um, completed a 2.9 inch e-ink breakout fritzing object and the TFT gizmo fritzing object, the latter of which was, um, actually they're both a little bit complicated, but um, not terrible. So got through those, figured them out, had to get help um, like you do. So this week, uh, today is Library Monday. Um, the get final approval on the Circuit Playground Bluefruit Bluetooth example pages is actually done. Um, I need to touch base with Justin about finishing the updates to circuitpython.org. There is a PR open that I believe all we need to do is merge it, but we were waiting um, until Monday so that we were not merging a big change on a Friday. Um, I need to finish updating the trellis guide to have CircuitPython and Python usage and examples. Uh, we currently don't have um, those in that guide and someone pointed that out. So we are fixing that up so that you can use your original monochrome trellis with CircuitPython. Um, so we have a library for it, but it just wasn't in the guide. Um, then after that, I'm going to finish up the um, revamp of the MicroPython OLED watch guide from ages ago um, with CircuitPython. The code is pretty much done. It was just waiting for an actual 5.0 release so that we could link to something that worked um, and not have people going to the S3 bucket to try and download a release. Um, we are well into that and the OLED issue has been fixed. So that's ready now for me to at least um, get that finished up and hand it over to Noah and Pedro who are super excited to actually redo most of that guide, including the print job, I believe the, the 3D print um, case for it, they wanna change it up. So they're excited about that and that will be um, my part of that will be done. I'm going to be deprecating a list of guides and pointing them to the updated versions of said guides. And then uh, I'm going to be updating the PyPI spreadsheet. Um, this was created when we initially went through and did the push to get all of our libraries onto PyPI because we had uh, Adafruit uh, Blinka, the Blinka library that makes it possible to use CircuitPython libraries on Linux. Um, and we got all of the libraries onto PyPI, but we did not get through updating all of the guides. And that was sort of left alone for a while. Some of those guides have been updated since. So what needs to happen is that spreadsheet needs to be updated so we can get a visual on what's actually left to update. Um, and then we wanna go through and, and do that because that means we can deprecate Python libraries that we haven't been supporting for a long time anyway. Um, and that is going to be uh, super great. So I want to get that updated. So we just have like all in a central place exactly where we're at. And then the next step is to um, the first libraries we're going to work through deprecating are the motor and servo libraries starting with the PCA 9685. Um, 
And that means we will archive the repo, leave it there for posterity and link to the CircuitPython version. Um, so we're only supporting one library across the board. Uh, and at the moment, that is what is on my list. So next up, I have someone in the notes. Uh, Crayola says, last week, fixed adafruit.star.py and neopixel.py to work with the latest pixel buff work. Made Travis not hate me uh, with my new pixel buff API branch of CircuitPython. Mostly made pixel buff dot pixel buff subclassable and promptly broke both of the underscore pixel buff compatible versions of dot star and neopixel. Made Travis hate me again on the new pixel buff API branch. Spent too much time trying to figure out what I broke in underscore pixel buff when I was trying to set up a Metro M4 with my Seger to debug, when in fact the NeoPixel Featherwing was just not happy with the terminal, terminal block breakout Featherwing, even with a level shifter. Discovered that it's apparently not straightforward, but apparently should be, to call a subclass method from a native, at least not during slicing subscript, and spent a lot of time in the debugger. Discovered that I can't just ignore slices with step greater than one in underscore pixel buff because there are plenty of examples that use colon colon two and similar around. Hi, Katni. That's because that's my fault. Uh, discovered that underscore pixel buff also needs to be iterable. This week, continue to try to make underscore pixel buff dot pixel buff be able to call show on a subclass during auto write equals true or come up with a reasonable alternative approach. Make pixel buff iterable. Work to support slices with step greater than one. Add a native dot fill to pixel buff. Update my branches of neopixel.py and adafruit.star.py to be compatible with the latest and greatest underscore pixel buff. And sometime after this week, continue on hardware compatibility testing and work on pi pixel buff to make sure the hardware that doesn't fit underscore pixel buff can still do neopixels and dot stars. And that is Crayola's report. Next up is maker Melissa. Hello. So last week I finished the TFT gizmo guide. I got Travis tests working out for the Arduino Circuit Playground Blue Fruit PRs. Um, I finished adding the TFT gizmo tests for passing the ST7789 Arduino driver. Added the TFT gizmo example and associated tests to the Arduino image loader library. I added TFT gizmo example to the Arduino Arcada library. I tested out a couple PRs for Circa. Uh, started working on writing examples for the RGB display on the Raspberry Pi, and I tested out Carter's uh, Spy Neo Pixel pull requests on the Orange Pi and kept that working. Uh, this next week, I'm going to finish writing the RGB, or at least work, continue working on the RGB display examples. Like, there's a lot of them now that I, or no, I'm going to finish the, the examples, then I'm going to start on the updating the display guides, and that's going to probably be several weeks. And I'm going to review any relevant years. All right. And that's it. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a couple of lurkers, and then I have um, people in the notes, and then uh, some text only people. So I will read those off, starting with Entol, who is uh, missing the meeting. Um, last week, uh, various minor circup things. See uh, github.com slash adafruit slash circup slash commits slash master for a good summary. And this week, it's a moorathon. That joke never gets old. Basically, I'm spending my time code gardening on Mu. If folks have feedback, feature requests, or other Mu related stuff, this week would be a good week to tell me. Thank you. Next up is Sedacious who says last week, LSM 303 driver wrangling, Travising PyPIing of Circup, received and assembled my keypad PCBs this week, LSM 303 drivers, and bringing up more boards. Next up is Summersoft, who is text only. Last week, finally got CircuitPython org slash libraries.json working prop or properly deploying to S3. With Adabot, worked out a quick script to iterate through our repos and apply the Hacktoberfest label to open issues that are marked as good first issue. Added that script to the daily run of CircuitPython underscore libraries so that any additional issues that come up are processed during the month. Further, the Hacktoberfest label will be removed after the event ends. Expanded validate contents to search subfolders in repo slash examples. Allowed empty top folders if they have subfolders and ensures files in subfolders meet the standards. 
and Circup fixed an issue and deployments to PyPI. This week, I'm not sure yet. I will hunt for something. And next up is Scott. Hello. Uh, last week, I was in the BLE weeds, which are super fun. Um, switching up a lot of stuff uh, to give you a preview. I unified central and peripheral into connection. Uh, kind of the insight there is that like BLE is really two things. It's one, when you're not connected, discovering the devices around you or broadcasting to them that you exist. Uh, so scanning and advertising. And then once you've connected, like the world is different um, and it's more similar uh, than you think. So that's why I unified into connection. And I also, uh, for the first part of scanning and advertising, I merged that into adapter rather than having a separate uh, scanning class. And, and advertising was part of peripheral, which was weird too. So uh, merge that, uh, which means that you don't need to have a peripheral object to create a service. Uh, you just construct a service object. And that that's a local service that you provide to other folks. Um, I got a little sidetracked. Uh, there's some really, I think, very useful magic that I want to happen where um, if you do an, like a scan for ad advertisements, uh, you'll automatically get back the objects for the types of advertisements that you're seeing. Um, I started to do that in in uh, BLEIO, underscore BLEIO and realized like, all I'm trying to do is redo the stuff that I've already done in Python. That's silly. Um, so I undid some of that stuff and kind of left some of those same boundaries that Dan had previously. Um, and then later in the week, I realized that scanning should really return an iterator. Uh, the way it worked uh, prior to that was that you would say like, OK, scan for 10 seconds. And then you get a big long list uh, as a result of that. And I was thinking, that's kind of silly. Um, what we should do is we should return an iterator so that basically as results of what you're what you're scanning for come back, you can look at them and potentially even stop scanning early if, if you found what you're looking for. Um, on the flip side, uh, because you're able to scan and look at the results at the same time, we'll also be able to do things where you don't even care to connect at all. You just care to listen for broadcasts that say like, Hey, set your NeoPixel. If you're listening, set your NeoPixel color to red. Um, and I kind of think of that as the forever loop. So uh, a lot of our examples have while true loops. This will be a forever for loop where you're just always reading in uh, things to do. Um, so that's going to be cool. And that's uh, the first thing that I'm going to tackle after I'm through uh, PRs today. Um, a couple random fixes I did last week as well. I fixed an issue with the outdated bus device library being frozen in. People were um, getting errors from that being frozen in, so I, I updated that. It might actually be worth doing an alpha 5 just to get that. So uh, we'll see. And then I also fixed a board inclusion script to actually fail when one's not included. I discovered some of the new uh, the new STM boards weren't actually being built, uh, and so realized that like although I had fixed or I had added the test for it, the test was only failing if they were added but in the wrong order. They didn't it didn't fail if they weren't added at all. So I fixed that. Um so yeah this week uh starting with the BLE uh bug hunting the the iterator stuff uh it's not actually working yet but I want to get it working. Um the I, I should also say that when you scan you'll be able to say like here are the things that I want to look for in the advertisements. So you basically can filter at the lowest level, which should help memory use. So I added that. Um, yeah, the next thing I have to do also is that like uh, the scan, the iterator will block if there's nothing, like no new results. And I need to make sure that if you control C or do an auto reload during that time, that will it will actually uh, control C or auto reload for you. So that's the first thing I've got to do. Um, I'm also debating whether this kind of iterator style is best for uh, incoming values that like you need to buffer as well. So uh, I'm thinking on that. And more generally, what I'm trying to wrap up all these changes I've made. So uh, there's some really great examples that Dan did in the BLE library, and I want to make sure that all of those exist in the new version and work. So that's kind of the goal for the week is to get the, all 
get all of the existing examples and maybe some new examples all working. Uh, so yeah, lots of Ely. All right. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Next up <clears throat> is Brent. Hello. Uh, this past week, I've been working on getting CircuitPython working with AWS IoT, which is the last large cloud provider we have for now until somebody else makes one. Um, I spent the majority of my last week hacking on the Nina firmware, which runs on the ESP32 airlift boards. I did some work on the Wi-Fi SSL client and learned a little bit of how embed works, but not enough to write really good embed code um, to allow uh, user-specified X509 certificate and private key. So this is going to be useful for um, Wi-Fi, uh, rather IoT providers like Amazon and Azure that don't have an authentication scheme that requires you to pass the token. So lower powered authentication, uh, so you're sending less data. Um, it's also really useful for managed uh, like enterprise environments, uh, which we occasionally get support questions for Adafruit IO, like why can't I use this at my work? Why can't I use this at my school? Um, so a network administrator will be able to provide an X509 certificate, which would be kind of useful for people who want to use this in academic environments too. Um, I wrote a better make file for the workflow. It reflects uh, the Spressif workflow um, with CircuitPython specific steps like flashing um, the UF2 files. And I connected successfully to AWS IoT, which was not what I expected to do last week, but I did. Um, but the device certificate and key are hard coded into the library. Um, passing it in and dynamically allocating a buffer uh, causes it to fail. And uh, I'm working through the memory allocation issue this week. Um, I'm not sure where the issue is, but um, when it does, when embed TLS does all of the, uh, um, it parses the certificates and it allocates very large buffers. So a buffer that we define uh, causes it to run out of RAM. And uh, I filed an issue on the CircuitPython um, repo for maybe having a native SSL TLS protocol implementation on CircuitPython, so it'll run quicker and we don't need to rely on an ESP32 because maybe that'll be outdated in the future. And this week, so I'm working on some other stuff that won't materialize for a while today, and then um, hopefully solving and unblocking myself with the RAM issue, and then I'll do a guide for it after. That's it. Sounds good. Thanks for all the work on that. All right, uh, next up is C. Grover. Well, hello. Um, so this last week, the prototype string car M0 Express board passed all the tests with uh, Alpha 4. And the um, the unbodged version of that now, though, went to Oshpark. There are only two trace bodges needed, but it was a good excuse to improve the design. And uh, a side note, late at night, I've been designing an M4 version. That's kind of fun too. Uh, struggling a bit though with how to set up my software development environment in WSL it, for building custom bootloaders. I think I'm missing some important elements in the path, but I haven't figured it out yet. Um, you know, I'm a hardware guy mm -hmm. and I'm a Linux newbie. So there's a lot missing from my skill set. But it's, it is a good opportunity to learn and I'm having fun. Um, I only have an occasional frustrating moment or two, well, maybe three. <laughs> I used a different uh, two megabyte flash chip in my design uh, because I had them on hand. So while I'm waiting for the new boards to arrive, I'll submit the new flash chip definition for others to use. Let's see. Um, this week, besides learning about what's missing from my Linux development environment, I'm going to wrap up a 10 volt 16 bit DAC project as well as making a new wooden domino carrying case. All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Dan. Um, OK, finally, after a couple of weeks uh, of work on and off, we got um, gamepad support to work uh, with the uh, Xbox adaptive controller. Turned out that there were just some fixes in the tiny USB library that we didn't have yet. And after updating it to the latest version, 
it worked and I tested it on an Xbox. So this means people who want, we now have a um, way to um, support, say with a Circuit Playground Express, uh, emulating a gamepad or a joystick kind of device that's compatible with the XAC. And then I've been doing a lot of work on, uh, I was working on BLE bonding and I needed to add a different file system for that. And then in order to do that, I needed to uh, refactor some existing file system code. And then I saw some more things that needed to be redone. And it, it just got into this thing where like, sort of like picking out a sweater and then you end up with a ball of yarn. So I wanted to stop doing that. So I'm going to backpedal a bit and just do bonding with the existing fat FS, not the new uh, file system, and then try to go back and do the other things in an, in a way so they're not all connected to each other, which is true right now. Uh, and I gave an example in the notes about how in our own, this is a true story that in our own bathroom, we had a, a couple of loose bathroom tiles and it turned out that the wall was all wet and then it turned out we needed to replace all that and we ended up renovating the bathroom. So it was kind of like that. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's my story for this week. But I think I've stopped, I've successfully glued, I'm gonna glue the tiles back on without renovating the bathroom. That's what I hope. All right, good luck. All right, excellent. Next up is Dave Bertetti. Good everybody. First, um, so I teach, I teach privately and I teach at a junior high. I'm inspired this year by Harvard's CS50 course, which is available online. Um, the teacher, David Malin, is really um, an inspiration. And so he has the students get up and hold a number and then they sort themselves using a bubble sort that with my students and I showed them the video in the notes here with the Hungarian dancers doing the bubble sort. I told them they could, they wanted and a lot of them did dance and some of them really didn't want to dance and I didn't make them. They'll remember bubble sort for a long time now. Burger Playground Express Sound. I've and learned a lot and there's a lot to this and I think maybe move most of this to the in the weeds if people are interested started with tilting arpeggios and I with uneven volume and pauses between playing the notes and I wanted to fix those and I have fixed those um, as you can see down toward the end and as a result of that, I have lots of changes that we could make to the, I know there's memory constraints. I experienced some of them myself. No pressure when there's time, if there's any interest in merging some of this stuff. Um, but, um, and in the pull request and in the notes here, I've documented a lot of the uh, very interesting things that I've learned. And, and just to summarize, this, some things I played around with are adding um, square wave and triangle wave in addition to the sine wave, adding um, the ability to change the volume to um, arbitrary um, gradations. And that all works pretty well. So anybody interested in that, just follow some of those links and let me and indicate if we want to uh, There are no rush. There's so much exciting stuff going on. I don't want to delay any of it. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, next up is Dashipu, who I believe is text only. Ah, okay. So helped on the micro quisket circuit python workshop last friday at the quantum day in zurich at the end um, of and there is a link in the notes so next up uh deherado is lurking so next up is higher effect
I can't hear you. Is it me or is it? Can anybody else hear Iron Effect? Nope. All right. Still can't hear you. If you want to type it out, we can. I can read it for you. Um, we can go on to the next person, and then I can read yours off if you want to do that instead. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, let's. Yeah. Okay. We'll do. Um, so that means no, no, no worries. Next up is uh, Jason P. Okay. Well, like I said last week, I did a little bit more with the display I.O. stuff, trying to chase down this transparency, some of the shapes. And so trying to make sense of the bitmap and palette and how all these those things stitch together. And so again, uh, thanks to Scott for helping out with that. Focused primarily um, work-wise on a completely different project, not related to CircuitPython the last week and a half or so, but going to be starting this next week to prep for a board we are developing that's going to support CircuitPython. And it'll be a uh, SAMD51, and it'll have an Intel Max 10 FPGA on it. So we're going to be ordering PCBs on those, I think, this week sometime. So kind of gearing up to get those ready. Nice. Or to be ready to, to put CircuitPython on those. Yeah, it should be fun. So uh, I've been barking about adding CircuitPython support around here for quite a while. So we're going to be doing that. So that'd be cool. And then uh, on the personal side, going to be also brainstorming ideas. My daughter's getting married in February. Venues want flame. So we're trying to find ways to do things instead of candles or fire. That would mm -hmm. look really cool as well. So just thinking about ways we could use NeoPixels and be able to kind of control them and do something that would um, in lieu of using candles. So we be starting to think about that too. There's a lot of, um, there's, I don't know about a lot, but there's a number of projects that use um, NeoPixels uh, to do flame type code. Um, it won't be the BLE side of things, obviously, but that part you can right. adapt. Um, sure. but, but the LED code exists. So check out on learn.adafruit.com. Um, yeah. There's a few um, examples of creating uh, flame-like flickering with, um, with LEDs. So that might help you out. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. I've seen a few of them, and I think it could look really neat. And but being able to the BLE part would be pretty cool if we could even change colors, like right down or something like that, as it kind of tracks with her. That would be pretty awesome. So we'll see. We'll come up with something. But I, I appreciate any pointers people have. Yeah, keep us posted on both of those things. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, last step, then, where we go back to Hyro Effect. Okay, can you hear me now? I can. All right, yay, sorry. It seems like Discord sometimes likes to speak. It switches my headphones and my microphone from my Bluetooth earphones. That sounds Bluetooth. about right. So anyway, uh, so this past week I was working mostly on uh, SPI Flash. Um, so on the upcoming F4, Feather F405, we will have SPI uh, flash the same as most uh, CircuitPython boards, and hopefully on a number of discovery boards as well with CircuitPython that uh, happen to have uh, SPI or QSPI chips on them, which makes it much easier to write to STM32. Because uh, for those of you who haven't been involved with support, but the SPI, STM internal flash is kind of wonky. It's a little bit very, very big sectors for erasing, so it can be kind of finicky. So having a SPI flash is uh, very nice to have. Um, this week, I'm going to be working on uh, UART, um, which is coming along, but it's a little bit different than the other peripherals, so it's a little bit slow. And uh, probably wrapping up with uh, the digital to analog converter, after which we will have most of kind of the baseline features of CircuitPython on STM32, which will be uh, fairly cool. Um, I've got a huge pile of or different feather boards, uh, feather feather wings, sorry, on my desk now. So we'll be able to uh, test those out and um, uh, kind of a good base of support with not just uh, kind of the base features, but the libraries, the uh, feather wings, um, all the general options for us to do too. So, and then it's probably going to be clean up after that. 
So that's it for me. Excellent. Thank you. And that is status updates. So next up is in the weeds. Uh, in the weeds is where we have more long form discussions, um, questions anyone has or um, things they want to talk about. Um, we, uh, we move that to in the weeds. And so feel free to add your topic to in the weeds. Um, and uh, while we're while we're talking about other topics that way we're not waiting to see if anyone comes up with anything else um so first up i will hand it off to dan for the first in the weeds topic okay i have two things which don't necessarily require a decision right away but came up when i was doing all this uh, refactoring um one thing that's true is that we haven't um removed uh, ports for boards that are left over from MicroPython source code. And in the past, I said, oh, let's not bother to do this because it just makes merging more complicated. For instance, if there's a merge that um, adds, or re adds files to those, they'll reappear. And so we'll have to take them away. Um, over the past few days, I've been like looking for a lot of things in a lot of places uh, using grep or the equivalent and it just I got pretty tired of seeing false alarms for things in uh, on board ports that have nothing to do with what I'm looking at so I'm just wondering if that if you might reconsider that decision we've also occasionally had people say like how come you don't support board x even though it's in your source tree and this would fix that support issue but I it is pretty minor so if anybody has some opinion about that I'd be interested in in hearing it one way or the other. I guess it's probably mostly Scott, but. <laughs> hey, well, I wanted to pop in here uh, just to kind of, because I was about to add this actually as another in the weeds topic, but I'm going to just hijack yours, Dan. Um, okay. I was actually in the process of cleaning up the STM32 port. Um, I was considering putting together an empty template directory uh, or considering pitching this an empty template port uh, for prospective future STM32 or uh, prospective future circuit Python ports. That would be the absolute minimum because we were talking about stubs earlier in the week, like include by default basically versus what gets, uh, you know, what, what you have to turn on uh, as you proceed through port. Um, mm -hmm. And having the stubs basically a, a, an entire Circuit Python port, which is a stub, literally. It's just it's just a very very basic you need to compile, and then you add on top of that. Um, and just one of the things that I noticed uh, as I was kind of trying to reduce down stuff in the, just the the ports directories are things that maybe could be moved around, or maybe we don't need them anymore, or have just like a lot of MicroPython language attached to them. Uh, you know that are like there's a bunch of stuff just in the um, you know, the base port, like, uh, you know, this, this little fat, um, just a whole bunch of different files that are in the, the base directory of the port and, uh, and kind of a bunch of, uh, macros too, that are spread across the settings of those, of the port, uh, that, I don't know, maybe we could consider that as part of this, but I don't know, so it has sort of a leftover feel to it. Right. So, I mean, as I, and that's sort of the same logic about not interfering with merges, comes up, but I'm, as we decide less and less to merge, the last time I did a merge, it took about two weeks because it was a lot of trouble. And maybe it's sort of the case that we need to start doing merges in a more selective way or considering cherry picking co commits or something like that. Um, not that maybe necessarily literally, but uh, because what we're concerned with mostly with merging from MicroPython now is core language stuff and not all the rest of the stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's anyway, it's something to think about. Maybe I'll, Scott and I can talk about this offline. Well, no, I would just say, uh, yes, delete okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Like, uh, I'm totally on board with that. And I don't think, you know, deleting a directory is not going to make a merge harder. Like, it's yeah, easy that's, to that's re delete the, the directory. Right. right. Um, 
And then talking uh, about Lucien's proposal of having a template uh, port, I really like that idea. Um, there is a spot for stubs, supervisor stubs already. Um, so this would mostly just be, this is a very lightweight thing. I'm not suggesting. Yeah. There is a minimal MicroPython port already that only has three or four files in it. But the minimal one sucks. Like, that's what I started with. And, like, I spent the next two months adding stuff back in because that's what people expected. Right, right. I don't th I'm not suggesting it's a good starting point. It's just that such a thing exists and we have to call it something else. Correct. Yeah. But I like the I like this idea of like having a micro having a circuit python port that just runs on any chip basically, right? Like once you set your architecture and your GCC, you can build it and you can at least verify that it runs. Right, that's yeah. that's what I was shooting for. I was thinking that probably the hardest part of that would just be the linker file, but maybe just having like an example linker file and just saying, hey, you need to replace at least this right. with your, but basically everything other than that, because we're, we're actually pretty close to that. Like with the amount of some of the macros that I've added, the amount of stubs that we now have in supervisor, mm -hmm. um, you barely need anything uh, right. other than the linker and maybe like some startup code. Um, so, and I, it, I think it'd be not yeah, a lot of work. I, I think it's a good idea, but I would, I would caution against doing it too early because, like, we still have lots of STM stuff to finish. Sure. I think that once, once we're, once STM's to a point where we like can do the majority of the things, then I think it would be, and, and maybe you know, maybe we have another um, port in the works as well, like the IMX. Like maybe the first step to doing the IMX is just doing this template first. I mean, I, I think that this is less of a issue that's been pressing for me, but more of one that I've like been running into some of these leftover scraps as I uh, kind of move through cleanup, you know? Mm. Yeah. Like when it comes to like macros and that kind of stuff, um, thinking about which ones get included by default, which ones are maybe like conflicting with other aspects of the port. Um, right. Some of these macros are just left over, or some of these full files are just left over from, you know, MicroPython. So, right. Uh, all right, all right. So that's I'll, I'll I'll prepare a PR sooner or later that does some cleanup, and then we can also talk about the other things too. But I'll do a simple one first. Okay. All right. And then the other thing that has happened is that one of the things I noticed when when I was refactoring the virtual file system stuff is that. There are a lot of tests, or there are tests in the micro. We've been using the MicroPython, Unix MicroPython port to do some regression testing. It's not great for that, but it's good at testing whether language features are great. Mm -hmm. And it depends on, it's compiled with things in XMOD, and it doesn't know anything about shared binding and so forth. So okay. if I moved VFS and if I moved regular expression and JSON out of XMOD, then they would no longer, the MicroPython tests would no longer be testing our versions of those. They'd be testing the old version. Right. And so maybe it's now time to come up with a, another Unix port that's, um, that is more CircuitPython centric. For just testing. Just to be able to do the test, just to be able to do coverage tests. So uh, it could also be done on a board, but that's a lot more work. That's we need Rosie or something again. If right. we do it on on an, on without cross compiling, that might be nice. So I haven't right. really thought about this very hard, but it was it came up because it's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm I'm moving things around, and I'm I was worried about leaving versions behind so that the Unix port would still work. Right, and right. I'm not sure if it's worth it anymore. Like I was leaving versions of VFS stuff behind in XMOD as opposed to getting rid of XMOD completely. Right. And so I'm I'm not really sure whether to bother to do that. I think I I kind of like the 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 approach of the Unix port is great for comparing with how C Python performs, but yeah. I think they're 
we could go the other direction and actually have more C level unit tests. Um, and not worry about the like, not worry about having the the Python VM actually be involved at all. Like a lot of that logic I added for display IO would be good to test just with C level tests. So calling, so sort of have having common how unit level C based yeah. unit tests rather than having to worry about. And I, I mean that's that's better for the things that are not trying to mimic C Python stuff. Um, but it could it's apply nice to those to as well. The, the shared binding part as opposed to the shared module part, though. So. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but and you can, simple, yeah. I mean, you could test shared bindings by passing in the like Python structs and stuff, but you're not making sure that all the like top level structs are correct. Right. Well, so I'll just think about this some more and see if there's some other way of organizing it, and also whether I should still try to maintain the the Unix MicroPython part part of our part, port that's in our source tree. Whether we should right. I should refrain from breaking that or not. So I can talk to you about. Or we just overtake it and make it work with our stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But these are all these things, which, as I mentioned, it's like, as I said, I'm pulling a string, and a lot of things are <laughs> all the all the toothpicks are. I'm playing uh, Django with those. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So the high level bit is to figure out how you're not playing Django anymore. That's right. Yeah. 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 To decide to start a new Django pile, as opposed <laughs> to the existing one. Yeah. You want like five games of Django, not one. Right. Right. <laughs> Okay, so that's those are those are my thoughts. With okay. All right, excellent. Uh, next up, I will hand it over to Dave Brichetti. Hi again. Hopefully, there's some people here who can quickly answer some questions for me. Um, and I think maybe Dan, you and I were talking about the time um, monotonic. I'm not being reliable in certain circumstances. I wonder if that. Is a factor in this? Yeah, I don't know why that's true, but it is. A number of people have reported that. Maybe it's at the wrong interrupt level or something. I don't really know. So uh, I wasn't necessarily. I mean, may, I might look at it a bit to see if there's an easy fix. But the ultimate fix is that we want to stop doing timekeeping the way that we're currently doing it, and use the on-chip real-time clock rather than using the one millisecond interrupts using SysTick, which is the current way we're doing timekeeping. I see. OK, so maybe that's, if that is, if this problem I'm experiencing is in fact caused by that, then uh, maybe I'll just live with it for a while and, and see what Right, happens. it could be that, yeah, we need to, um, that the interrupt level, that the interrupt, the SysTick one millisecond interrupts are getting starved out somehow. The, the, and I, the odd I thing thought I, I need, just need to look at the interrupt priorities, or one of us does, yeah. The odd thing is that the problem only is appearing when I use the square waveform. And first I thought, well, maybe that's because the sine waveform has 100 samples, um, only has two. And so I then I made a square waveform with 100 samples, and still only the square waveform had this problem where if you see in the notes there, I've got that sleep time equals next note play time minus time yeah. monotonic, and then I sleep for sleep time. Um, I, I believe that ends early, but only in the case of the square waveform. So um, that's really for letting odd. me know. <laughs> yeah, it's a strange thing. The other reason we want to move off SysTick is we want to start doing some sleep stuff. And SysTick is dependent on the clock of the core, which is what sleep would shut down <laughs> yeah yeah cystic only works when the processor is running full power right. which could also be the issue if like one of the libraries is actually like sleeping the core that could be it as well okay so well, i look so. forward to the day when i understand the lower levels a little bit better so i can me too <laughs> I look forward to the day when when i understand it or when, when you understand it when i understand it and when you understand it, if anybody understands it, that would be awesome. Okay. Uh, and then finally, my last item is: uh, Are there 
do you have a guide or can you give me some general tips for reducing memory use? Because I, because Katney warned me that things were pretty tight with that library, the Express class, and uh, so I mixed that with my. And uh, then I got two types of memory failures: one very general, and then another specifically saying trying to allocate 61 bytes of memory or something. So how can I learn a little bit about what's going on there and how to avoid that? Well, the, when I looked at your code, uh, you're, you're basically caching waveforms for various notes. Not anymore. Right. Not anymore. Oh, okay. That was easy okay. pickings. You gotta, you gotta, it's harder now to, to help mm -hmm. me. <laughs> okay. The other thing is that it's, it is true that, um, I mean, there, if you don't freeze the CPX library, then it uses up RAM when it gets imported. We don't really have enough room left on the original Circuit Plugger Express to make the frozen libraries any bigger. They're already too big, really. Mm -hmm. And so we really can't add more code to the CPX library. It doesn't mean that you couldn't add a helper that does some things that does like more sophisticated note playing. It would be great to have an auxiliary library that, that, and you know, maybe if you need to add one function, like play from RAM or something like that, or play from a buffer, that would be, we could add that to the CPX library, but in, we can't add any significant amount of code to the CPX library. Well, right I understand now. that. I understand yeah. that. So, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So I just I, I was just thinking that maybe if you think about it as another library that somebody could import that would then be used by the CPX library, you know, that would there would be one function in the CPX library that would play from a buffer or something like that. That I wasn't I'm not really sure, but uh, that that would be okay and, and would allow us to kind of augment the library in some expandable way. Yeah. Well, since since you looked at the pull request, um, I've kind of changed approaches. And one of my one proposal now would be just to, since these waves really, when they come through that tiny speaker, the sound wave, the sine wave sounds quite a bit like the square wave. Um, so one approach would be just to just to only use a square wave because you don't have to have the hundred samples or whatever. You just need two, so you save a little bit of memory there. And then some other changes would be not to reset the, uh, I, don't, I don't want to go and look in my notes again, but uh, we can solve a couple of problems and make it actually a little smaller if you're comfortable with the square wave. So I I really like, that people also can attach a speaker and maybe it would sound better with a sine wave. And oh, okay. in fact, there's a, um, there's a speaker that has a stem a clip on it now that you just alligator clip it to the board and then you've got a speaker okay all right so the sine wave needs to stay then mm -hmm. I, I understand that okay so then just to backing up to general memory use so let's say i'm using things as they are and i'm just developing example programs what kinds of things should i watch out for uh, for instance i had several classes in this program and when i merged them all into one class then one of these types of memory errors went away. So import order matters um, with memory allocation. In terms of the class, it's probably because um, memory allocation failures are when there is, or typically anyway, when there is not a big enough block of memory to hold whatever it is you're trying to do. And code or the dynamically allocated stuff? Uh, I want to say it is dynamically allocated. Unless it's frozen and it's stored in RAM. OK, so is that coming from the same pool of memory that, say, if I were to yes. just create a list and append things to it? Yes. Yeah, and there's some logic to, like, when you import, we try to put it in a particular part of the same area, but it is the same area still. Um, there, I did a like three hour live stream kind of explaining how it works and how I have some debugging for it. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, well, I'll go watch that then. Can you send me a pointer? Yeah, let me find it. Um, or tell me what to search for. I'll, I'll find it and post it in the. Thing. That's great. 
Okay, so I've taken enough time. Yeah. Caddy, is there is there like a page somewhere that talks about doing GCs between imports or something too? Um, we, do, we do it automatically. After an import, we run the GC. Okay. It still weirdly sometimes helps to have it in the code. Um, we, I, I want to say it's either in CircuitPython expectations or in the troubleshooting page that's found on pretty much every board. There is a very low level um, basic quick discussion of memory allocation failure and what you can do to um, not have it happen, but it's um, you're going to get a much better piece of information um, from watching that video than you are from the page. Yeah, but there is a page that talks about it, um, but it's very general. And, and it's also true is that there just really is not enough RAM on the SAMB21 boards. Right. Yeah. There's yeah. more on the the Bluetooth version, right? Yeah. Correct. You'd be much happier in the long run with Bluetooth. Right. I mean, unfortunately, right. it doesn't have the same. It doesn't have a DAC, but um, the SAMB51 boards, or if you used it like a Metro M4 or a Feather M4, you'd be much. You can write much larger programs. Right. Okay. Thanks again for the education. Sure. Yeah. All right. And next up, I have a question from Deshipu, who uh, is text only, so I will read that off. Um, what is the PPU 13 in the download stats, and how come it has downloads even when it doesn't appear on the downloads page? Summersoft responded with, I noticed that last night. I'll look into it. Looks to be coming from the build assets. Can't dive any further right now due to day job. And uh, the look... answer is uh, you can still download it through uh, Adafruit CircuitPython releases page on GitHub. And because we're using GitHub for the download stats. So it's probably just crawlers that are slurping everything off GitHub. Um, OK. So, yeah, is my, is my guess like like all of the downloads have been, like this baseline of like 12 or something right now. And like that's probably just scrapers pulling stuff down. Yeah, that all happened in one day. Um, the question is, what what is PPU 13 in terms of like, yeah, it's not a defined board. Uh, it could be an alias. Right, like we added the alias stuff, and I think we added a pew pew alias for pew pew thirteen is the same as pew pew ten, I think. Right, we added the alias stuff to be able to do it. Let me look. Um, Tishipu asks, uh, should I make a PR for removing it? Yeah. Yeah, if you look in tools build board info, there's an alias that makes a pew pew 13 for pew pew 10. I thought that's what you wanted because you had two different versions of the board, but it had the same binary. I thought that was intentional and that we wanted it. I could have sworn that you. <laughs> Didn't. Yeah, like, like we made we made some other board aliases. Like we have a four H board, which is the same. It's just a different color, but we gave it. Um, another... But you... it's nice because then you lit like on the downloads page, you show different form factors, for, even if it's the same board. Like if they look dramatically different, I would say leave it, even if it's the same code. It's better to have on the downloads page a, a variety of them so that people can find the thing they the exact thing they have. Okay. Yeah, it's just named wrong then. Um we're gonna need to remove it from uh CircuitPython org as well then. I thought it was I thought it was one point three. I don't know. Radimir would know. Yeah. Um, but there's a link to the Markdown page for it in CircuitPython.org. Right. In the notes. So I think if it's going to be removed, it, I think it needs to be removed from both places. Yes. I, yeah, removing it from CircuitPython does not remove it from CircuitPython.org. 
Oh, it's 10.3. Anyway, we can hunt it down. Okay. All right, excellent. And uh, we have just hit an hour 20, so I think it is a good time to wrap up. This has been the Circuit Python Weekly for October 7th, 2019. Um, thanks to everyone who participated. Uh, this meeting is held uh, every month, typically every Monday um, at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, in the uh, Adafruit Discord Circuit Python channel. And we are there all week. So if you uh, have any questions or want to chat us up, come find us. Uh, Adafru.it slash Discord will get you to the Discord server, and you can find us in the Circuit Python channel. Um, this uh, meeting was recorded and will be posted to YouTube as well as as a podcast. So if you are interested in one or the other, uh, it is available. And there will also be a notes document available attached to the YouTube video. And that way, if you are um, interested in only a single part, you can get to that part. There are time codes in the notes. And with that, I want to say thank you again to everyone who participated, and we will see you next week. Bye, all.